Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Graph Machine Learning Greening Group. And we're joined by Wu Ji, who is presenting his work on decoarsening coarse grained representations of molecules. And if you want to join the reading group discussions yourself, all the information is in the description. You know, I'm have really happy uh, here today to talk about uh, our recent paper, uh, Generative Coarse Graining of Molecular Conformations. So this is the joint, I forgot to list all the co-authors here, but it's uh, amazing, this amazing team include, you know, Ming Kai, Chen Cai, uh, uh, Ben Miller from University of Am Am uh, Amsterdam, uh, Professor Tess Smith, Professor Yu Su Wang, Professor Jian Tang, and my advisor, Rafael Gomez Bambrali. So I um, just forgot to list all the co authors name here. Um, so let's get started. So why not? Uh, it's, uh, it's, yes. uh, okay, so it's, it's rolling. So, okay, so uh, a main theme of machine learning or data analysis in the general machine learning fields are, uh, is centered around dimension reductions. Um, so why want to reduce dimension, dimensions of data? Uh, is usually because we are, uh, every day we are dealing a data set of really high dimensions and to compute and to extract information, those information at really high dimensions is usually very expensive. And because you have so many dimensions, uh, a lot of times it's, it's, you, it's get, you, you might get lost uh, uh, in extracting the really useful information. So assumption is that there usually exists some low dimensional structure uh, in the data which you can extract and, uh, and, and, and use. Um, so, with with the lower dimension of the data representation, we can uh, we can perform very efficient computation because the the memory requirement is lower, and it's usually uh, make it easy to interpret your data, and is also really great for visualization. So a lot of times people have really high dimensional data set, and they can do some dimension reduction tricks to reduce the data into two dimension, which can be printed on paper. So there are a lot of very useful techniques people have been using for dimension reductions. You know, the famous being the principal component analysis and autoencoders, you know, manifold learning. Uh, this, uh, and TSNI is very important, uh, is very useful and popular data visualization techniques. And of course, there's Fourier analysis decompose your data into different, uh, into modes of different frequencies. And also there's dynamic mode decomposition, which is used to, uh, perform dimension reductions for uh, dynamic data. So when we look at molecules, we are exactly, or you know, or, or molecular structures or biomolecules, we are usually looking at a, a very big structures with lots of atoms that lives in 3D. So for example, if you want to simulate a protein or, or an, analyze the, uh, the protein structure, so you are easily looking at this, uh, the size of tens, uh, hundreds of thousands of atoms. So you first, you need to have a protein which can easily have, um, you know, a hundred thousand atoms uh, to describe the full structure, and also you need to solve them in, in in water. So which will add just a lot more molecule molecules and atoms you want to simulate. So, so. So this is this is usually very expensive to simulate, even with today's computing power. So a lot of times, what people want is to reduce the dimension of this data space to fewer bits, uh, or or we we call it cost graining, so that we can perform more efficient computation, and also make it easier to analyze. Um, so this is the motivation. So we we just we also want to look at. Uh, the low dimensional data, uh, low dimensional structure in molecular data, especially the molecular geometry data. Some and some 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 basic history about the idea of cost screening. So the idea, of the uh, I th I think as far as I know, the the idea of cost screening was first proposed by the Ehrenfests. So Paul Ehrenfest and Titania Ehrenfest are very famous or very important stat, uh, statistical, statistical physics uh, who lived in the earliest uh, 20th century. So 
And Paul Ehrenfass is uh, is uh, Boltzmann's student. So Boltzmann is uh, is a is a is a founding scientist of the field statistical mechanics, basically. So, so after and uh, as some of you know, might know, so Paul uh, uh, Boltzmann committed suicide in 1905. Uh, 1905. So, so a publisher after his death, a publisher wants uh, Paul Ehrenfass, who's who is you know uh, Boltzmann students to to write a book chapter or to my to write a small book to summarize Boltzmann's important ideas. So. so so in that book, which is called The Conceptual Foundation of Statistical Approaching Mechanics, so uh, Paul Ehrenfass proposed the idea of coarse graining. So the basic idea is that uh, consider you have a very high dimensional phase space distribution, and you can discretize this distribution into grid, and imagine this distribution also evolved in time. And if, if, as, as illustrated in this picture, Imagine the phase, the, the density, uh, the spatial density involves in time uh, in this grid. And if you average over this motion of density evol evolution in time, you, 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 will re, uh, you will actually have a, a coarse grained or average observation of the density profile. And as you can see, due to the coarse graining, it actually increases in entropy. So that you know you have a very uh, uh, very narrow distribution to begin with, and after some evolution and averaging, you actually have a have a distribution that actually has high entropy, meaning more uncertain uh, than what you had before. So, so this is actually a very important idea because it uses to explain the the, the origin of irreversibility in molecular uh, in uh, in statistical mechanics. So this is how. Um, Cost screening first appear in, in history. Wait, uh, can you explain a little bit what uh, I don't entirely get what's going on here, right? We have some, like this bar, for example, what does it represent? Yeah, so, so the, the true distribution of this, of this, uh, of, of all the particle distribution should, uh, should be a continuous distribution. And what Ernst what Ehrenfest does is to discretize into bins, right? So to have a very very coarse uh, distribution of this density distribution. And imagine this density distribution can evolve over time, follow some governing equations. Yeah. And, and if you want to you know, take a more coarse look at this distribution over time, you actually end up with a, uh, with, with a distribution that has high entropy than what you had before. Okay, and this is also an issue, like if we, um, right, if we, if we now discretized and we move in the discretized space, like it's clear that if we're in the non-discretized space and then um, have some movement in the non-discretized space and then we discretize, then we end up with this distribution averaging in cells. But if we're in the coarse grain space or like in the discretized space and we have some movements uh, of a particle maybe in the discretized space, then we wouldn't end up with this distribution averaging, right? Uh, no, uh, I actually didn't follow your question. So, the, I think I think I, th I think the, the the way to understand it is that you want to understand it from a very coarse pers perspective, both in time and space. Um, due to because you you are seeing everything at a core uh, at a very coarse level, so that your your uncertainty increase. Maybe that's another way to understand it. Um, and you, it's hard to differentiate if this, you know, density profile lives in this bin or this bin. Well, after coarse greening, it's it has uh, uncertain, so it it has the uncertainty or, or distribution uncertainty that uh, that probabilistic distributes the density uh, uh, on the at the two bins simultaneously. Well, wait, okay, but so you're not calling the discretization the cost graining. You're uh, there's another step that we're doing, which is the cost graining. 
Is that right? Uh, yes, I think another another key uh, take uh, key understanding is that it also assumes that this coarse grain density moves collectively, so that um, you you have this being uh, the 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 phase field, uh, sorry the phase space density move collectively in time, so that the height of this density profile does not change as you move. Uh, yeah. Okay. But anyway, then let's maybe you move on. I will. Uh, I'll have to inform myself uh, myself uh, on, on, on this, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, but the basic idea is that this is argument Ehrenfass proposed uh, to explain the, the second law in some way, so that you have a microscopic physical laws that's time reversible, but how does, you know, the irreversibility or the, or the second law of thermal dynamics emerge? So this is one of the arguments he proposed. So that how you can have irreversibilities from you know, microscopically reversible physical laws. Um, so this actually could be Boltzmann's idea because this is, uh, this is a work that he wrote to summarize Boltzmann's uh, contributions to statistical mechanics. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, as, as a side fact, so Paul Ehrenfass committed suicide just like uh, uh, Boltzmann. So he committed suicide in 1933. Um, so maybe the takeaway is that don't work in, uh, don't work in statistical mechanics. So that will drive you crazy. Um, okay, so this is the first account of coarse graining maybe in history. Um, and nowadays, you know, this idea of dimension reduction of finding critical uh, reduced representation in physical uh, has been very popular in physical science. So on the left, we have the renormalization group uh, distribution of critical uh, uh, critical form phenomena, um, especially in phase transitions, and also the idea of a low dimensional uh, st structure or finding the right coarse grain coordinates very is very useful or is very important for the enhanced sampling. Um, purpose for molecular simulations. And also another type of core screening that has been very popular is, the, is to core screen a molecular conform, conformation to discretized states so that you can construct Markov state models. Um, so the type of core screening. Wait, uh, uh, Wuchi, before we move on, can we maybe yeah. uh, uh, point by John? Oh, hi. Yeah, I had a one way oh. of potentially explaining the the diagram that was shown previously uh, right. relating to the entropy increase. Sure. Yeah, so one way to think about it is, um, you know, you're taking some sort of um, average. Um, so from a, effectively, you're taking like a convolution uh, with some low pass filter over your distribution. Um, and that's basically why you, you're sort of smearing out the distribution through that averaging process. And, and that is why you end up increasing the entropy. Yeah, essentially that's the idea. So the smearing is also a cause grinding operation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry, actually. So this is not, this is actually not the main part of the presentation, yeah, but it's, sure. it's a but, distraction, but I think just we don't to care about, about it. what's the main part, we care about what's interesting. Let, yeah. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th this is just some uh, some side history that I find interesting. Yeah. Thanks um, for including. Yeah, so, so, and we have different kind of cross graining techniques we use in physical sciences, um, as I just described. And okay, so the first, also as far as I know, the first coarse grain simulation in, in history is, was conducted by uh, Professor Michael Levitt and uh, uh, Professor Warshell. Um, so it, it, it is, uh, so this work was actually done in 19, 1975. So this is the first computer simulation of protein folding. So, so they simulate some kind of protein, which I actually don't know about, uh, but, but, but they, they do realize that, you know, to simulate the full atomistic structure of this uh, polypeptide is actually really challenging. 
So they come up with the coarse grain representation to effectively describe the backbone and the side chain of the protein by single beads so that they can, they can have a simpler distribution, uh, descrip description of the coarse grain interact, uh, of the protein interaction um, and, also, and also uh, make it very, uh, very simple to simulate. So this is the first work that in history people simulate uh, uh, a biological structure on a computer. Um, so this is actually uh, very interesting in my perspective because in 1975, um, I don't know how they actually did it, but it's really amazing. Uh, yeah, how they could do this kind of work uh, with very little resources, you know, no Google, no software, they have to come up with everything by themselves. Yeah, um, what was the cost grinding they did? Oh, so it's actually in this, so this, the full atomistic distribution, uh, sorry, description of the polypeptide yeah. is, you know, can you see my cursor? Yeah, we see it. Okay, okay. So the cost graining they do is to cost grain the backbone. Um, and also if, if, uh, if the uh, if the uh, if if the amino acid has a really large side group, they also uh, use the additional B to represent that side group. Okay, so they they just have the like the alpha carbons, and then some additional uh, bead of mass in case we have large side chains. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah. Um, I think they realized that they couldn't simulate all, you know, such a big structure on a very, very uh, old computer. So they they figure out the yeah uh, a representation for it. Um, I didn't look into the paper carefully to know what kind of uh, you know energy models they use, but I I couldn't imagine. But still, I'm very impressed by by this work. You know, in 1975, they managed to do something like this. Uh, okay, so okay, so you you might think that nowadays we have better computers. You know, we might be it might be very easy to simulate you know a, a very large proteins um, at a you know microsecond or psych, uh, a millisecond uh, time scale. It's actually not true. If you want to simulate a, a a protein with full atom resolutions of you know the the usual time scale we are looking at is actually is only you know between nanosecond and microsecond, and protein folding happens between at the time scale of microsecond and millisecond. So we are still orders of uh, one order of magnitude, you know several orders of magnitude off. So still nowadays, if you want to simulate a full pro full protein. Um, you some a lot of times you need to uh, use a coarse grain model to simulate that. But we all know that coarse grain model is uh, is actually won't be uh, have the right accuracy because you know coarse grain uh, takes away a lot of important uh, information about interactions. So, well, so, what do you mean when you say protein folding happens at at the millisecond level, like? Yeah. So I, I think I'm not an expert uh, expert on protein folding, but imagine if you yeah if you are taking an unfolded uh, polypeptide chain, and imagine that chain evolves and coil to to you know to to be eventually become folded structure. I think if it, experimentally, I think that uh, the time scale is around uh, from microsecond to millisecond. So from going from at the the unfolded chain to the folded chain that happens in reality in our bodies in yes like that's the real time i'm talking about yeah okay and but this doesn't really this then isn't really the time step that we want for simulating this right and uh, so so for simulation uh, you want to simulate everything uh, you want to simulate the protein at a very short uh, uh, time increment. So usually we are talking about femtosecond. Um, so one femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 second. And imagine, so that's the, the yeah. if you want, yeah. 
So that's the sort of the time increment you usually want to take. And imagine you want to simulate uh, something that uh, has a time scale of milliseconds. So that's 10 to yeah. the minus, you know, 10 to the power of minus three. So that's a lot of, you know, integration you need to do. Also in the, in the presentation by Johannes Batzner that we had about this uh, Allegro model there, they were also using, but doing their molecular dynamics with femto second steps. Yeah, yeah. So that's usually the, the time step. Another, another benefit of cross screening model is that uh, after cross screening, so all the you know, uh, interactions has been uh, smoothened out. So you're, you, you, end up has, you end up with a very smooth free energy landscape. So you could use very a uh, longer time step. So sometimes people use 10 femtoseconds. So that's another benefit of cost screen modeling, which I will talk about later. Um, um, sorry, I, I want to know why here, the all atom simulation, uh, the time is shorter than the host range. Oh, I think it's just because you, you have a lot more particles you need to simulate. So, so for, the, for the protein solvate in uh, water example, you can easily have uh, hundreds of thousands of atoms you want to simulate. But after core screening, uh, you could, you know, core screening however you want. Uh, for example, uh, you I, can I see. Do... But why is it uh, all atom simulation, the time is shorter? Oh, oh, okay, okay. I think I understand your confusion. So this is actually, yeah. so this, so, so this, the x axis actually means that that's the longest time, the longest uh, time scale uh, all atom simulation can achieve. So with all the computing resources, at most you can simulate, you know, hundreds of nanoseconds or close to microseconds because it's very expensive. And for cost grain modeling, because the interactions are simpler, so you can expand the simulation uh, into a longer time scale. Does that answer your question? Okay, so you are uh, trying to say that uh, 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 for a certain uh, re restricted computational resources. Yes, the exactly. all, Yeah, I see, yeah, that's your yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. so. Uh, so yes, so so all atom simulation is not is not faster is or requires shorter time. It's it, because it, uh, it, uh, it's because it's very expensive, so that it actually uh, takes a lot of resources. So you have a limited uh, time scale that you can reach. So that's the idea. So that's another uh, uh, motivation to do cost screening. And some some basic some basic uh, literature review about how to uh, how to call screen and how to perform call screen simulations. So there actually there 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 have been a lot of literature around this topic. So so from the statistical mechanics points of view, so determine the call screen interactions um, is equivalent of is almost equivalent of approximate something called the potential of mean force. So that's Basically, the uh, the log of the the logarithm of the cos green uh, density function uh, from the statistical mechanics point of view. So this will assume that you want to uh, derive an effective potential that recovers the equilibrium uh, distribution uh, cos green distribution. So there's a, there's a very uh, there, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of literature. Uh, around this topic about how to derive such a potential to approximate the potential of mean force. And also dynamics is also is another as, uh, aspect that you, want to, you might want to consider. Uh, after cross screening, the dy dynamics is becomes actually more complicated than, you know, than the original uh, model. Uh, and I th um, and, I, and the reason why is that after cross screening, the dynamics become non-Markovian, so that you have to derive a, gen, a, a more generalized evol evolution rules to, uh, to, to take account such non-Markovian uh, non non um, 
so it, because it had after call screening, you the memory not automatically inverts, so you actually need to simulate uh, simulate system with memory. So this is another 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 deep field that people have been working on how to uh, construct such a generalized Landron equation to uh, simulate call screen dynamics, and also there so so. So finding, finding the potential of mean force and also parameterize the generalized Landron equations as a two bottom approach, meaning that you have a atomistic model and you want to, from, as your ground truth, and you want to uh, derive effective interactions or effective dynamics from, 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 bottom, uh, from bottom up. And there are also uh, top-down approaches people have been uh, doing, meaning that you, you want to parameterize the potential to uh, match the, uh, uh, to, to match some microscopic or experimental observation of your, of your simulation. So very famous example includes the Martini force field. Um, they, they, have, they develop very, uh, a systematic mapping and also a systematic potential uh, actually, a lookup table you can use to construct your molecules and the, uh, and actually pick the right potential for your simulation. Uh, so this is there's there's a lot of works around this uh, around these topics, but it's 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 actually still um, it's it has been still attracting a lot of um, attentions uh, in the field, mainly because making the right approximation. Uh, as accurate as possible is actually very challenging. Um, so this is the, the general uh, uh, state of the art of the coarse grain simulation and how, what kind of tools people have been using. Um, however, in this work, we are concerned the reverse task, you know, given a coarse representation, uh, how much information and how much, uh, and how much information can you uh, recover? So base, that's the basic idea. So compared to the, the forward cost screening problem, um, the rigorous methodologies and theory of back mapping has you know, re received relatively less attention. Um, and, and, why, and the natural question you ask is that, why we want to uh, try, to recover the, try to recover the atomistic information from cost screening information? The, the, the simple answer would be, you know, a lot of times when you simulate everything in coarse grain, you lose the actually the atomistic identity of your model, right? So you, if you simulate everything in the coarse grain coordinate, you are just, you know, simulating uh, some pseudo beads or some, some blobs of, blobs of uh, atoms uh, in time. And they don't carry act, uh, they don't actually carry any physical meaning in some sense because you lose the ident all the atomistic identity after call screening. So it's natural that you want to recover this those fine grained distribution of, descript, description of the data from a call screen simulation so that you can use it for downstream analysis and discovery. And for example, you know, so as as the example. After call screening, you lose the idea of hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond interactions. And we all know that a lot of times hydrogen bond interactions are very important uh, in those uh, protein configurations. So, and it's, it's a lot of times it's observable you, you, you care about. So, but the call screening usually does not have fine, such a fine grain, uh, such fine grain information. So you want to have a technique to try to recover uh, such fine grain information. And another, uh, another motivation to perform back mapping is that you want, sometimes you perform cause grain simulation to speed up the simulation. And eventually uh, for fast equilibration, equilibration of the system. And eventually you want to back map the system to fine grain resolution because uh, for, you know, for, for further analysis or further a uh, higher, uh, uh, more accurate ca calculation that requires uh, for uh, all atom inputs. So that's uh, the two motivations that you, why you want to uh, recover coarse, uh, recover fine grained uh, distribution from coarse grain distribution. So that's, that's the idea. So this is the problems of going backward.
Um, next, so uh, so then I will talk about you know some existing backmapping methods. So so as as I mentioned, so this field received relatively less attention than the forward cost screening problem of deriving the cost screening interactions. So um, so the the usual technique people have been using is uh, they so what they do is they derive some geometrical uh, projection rules from the cost grain uh, from the cost grain uh, geometries uh, to backmap to uh, fine grain geometry. So this usually involves some deterministic matrix transformation, uh, which you can construct. Um, and after that. Uh, a lot of times, the geometry, the fine grain geometries you obtain has has actually relatively low quality. So you want to uh, use a force field uh, as a fine grain resolution to correct for the mistakes that you that you made after this back mapping. Um, so there are several. There are there are many methods. Um, so most actually most methods are not data driven. So and and there there have been recently some methods that are data data driven, meaning that. Mm -hmm you are parametrizing the projection rules uh, uh, from data. So you do I get that correctly that we basically uh, do our back mapping and with some or whatever approach, and then we run some additional molecular dynamic steps to, uh, to then come up with a more plausible structure. Yeah, exactly. Um, so just from my experience, the geometrical projection that you Usually produce some really, really, really bad gas for your fine grain mapping. So, um, and a lot of them does not even preserve bonds. So that you actually have, you know, you actually you will see atoms that are glued together after projections, and that's actually that's obviously not physical. So you need to run additional simulation to correct for that mistake. But this yeah, is yeah, actually exactly. something we could also do on top of your. Uh, back mapping method, right? Yes, that's 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 also an option. Yes. Okay. Did you try any of that? Like, if no, the... I did not try any of <laughs> that. But but you could do. I think there's a there's a problem with that. Uh, is that um, a lot of times you want to perform back mapping. Um, you want you want you want the back map geometries to faithfully represent the the course geometry. But if you run additional simulation, you lose that, you know, original information about the original geometry because you are you are essentially running additional steps to yeah. evolve the systems. So the the structure you get is different from what you actually want. So but you could do that. Um, but uh, but I think in our in our task we want to make sure the back mapping uh, you know, recover the structure that corresponds to the core structure yeah. one to one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, so, so all this math. So there are some key considerations that has been missing in these methods. So, there there has not been any uh, analysis on the geometrical ge uh, requirements of back mapping, um, and and. Uh, and and so what by what I mean by that is they generally lack e three equivalence as the self consistency criterion, which I will talk about in more detail later. So there are some geometrical requirements that you should respect uh, for your back mapping process, and also those geometrical projection rules that people usually use is actually is usually uh, is, uh, is is very mapping specific. So they, they have to derive uh, geometrical reconstruction rules uh, specifically for a certain type of mapping. If you change your mapping, you need, to, you need to come up with another set of rules. So that's obviously not, you know, very, it's, it's not very general. So you, you, it's, it will be ideal to have a, um, back mapping tools that very general with any mapping protocols and, and also cost green resolutions that you want. Another uh, consideration that has been um, missing in the past literature is that cost graining destroys information. So when you back map, you want to you naturally want to 
uh, want your back mapping uh, technique to recover the missing information or the or the information has been coarse grained out um, during your back mapping operation. So that will mean that you want to uh, you you want to construct a probabilistic back mapping tool to account for the missing information. So that's how the, the so those are the three considerations that has been missing in the past literature. Um, so before I before I move on to talking about specifics about the specifics about our paper, so I will just uh, try to mention two related machine learning tasks that that you know some people from machine learning background might be more familiar. So th there's this task of graph coarsening. Uh, so th that's basically uh, essentially perform coarse screening on large graphs so that you you can so you you end up with fewer nodes and edges you want to process in your in your in your graph in your graph data and also also there's another interesting question of how to uh, preserve the spectral property of your coarsen graph uh, coarsen graph so there's you know so so my uh, so one of the coarsers uh, Chen Cai is, is, is an expert in, in this topic, so um, about graph coarsening. And another related topic is uh, perform image super resolution. So a lot of times you have very coarse uh, images that you want to store and process um, just be, due to maybe, for example, due to a memory constraint and you want to perform super resolution to improve the sharpness sharpness of your images. So those are the two related machine learning tasks that that's also very similar to the, the tasks we are proposing in here. Okay. Um, so before I move on, so there, so first I want to uh, introduce some definitions about coarse graining in our work and, uh, and, and also later uh, derive some geometrical requirements that that would that are needed to this uh, to construct a back mapping function so 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 let's see so you start with some fine-grained representation of your atomic system so that's uh, that will be a point set that lives in 3d space so the small n represents a number of all atom uh, particles uh, that you have and you want to construct a map to construct uh, to transform the the fine grained all atom representation into a coarse representation that has a big n number of particles. Said so we we need to make sure the the number of uh, the big n is smaller than small n. So to do that, you need to construct a cluster map that maps that basically partition. Uh, the fine grain graph into a coarse coarse grain graph. So a lot of these notations is actually borrowed from graph coarsening literature. Um, and you, uh, you know, given this cluster map, you can you can construct a, a coarse grain cluster. Um, basically, are the subsets of your of, of your all your fine grain nodes. And after you define such a cluster, a CG clustering. Um, you could pro, uh, you could define a projection matrix, a projection matrix that have size you know big n times small n, with each element defined uh, defined as this. So that's basically uh, so first you would need to define a, a atom wise projection weight, and you need to uh, and you need to normalize over those weights uh, within the cluster. Uh, to come up with a, uh, a projection matrix. So basic idea is to compute the weighted sum of your weighted sum of all the fine grain coordinates into one single coarse grain uh, coordinates within the cluster. And additionally, you will, you will need to define a lift operator, which is actually defining here, um, which will actually be useful later. So the basic idea of lift operator is you, you want because uh, coarse grain destroys uh, dimensions. So you want to go from a low dimensional to high dimensional, uh, to go back to the high dimensional uh, representation. So you want to 
have some uh, uh, operator to lift the coarse grain coronet back to the uh, fine grain coronet. So you, uh, I think those, the, this will be more clear when I uh, give an example in the next slide. Um, so consider you, consider you have a four node graph and you want to partition the graph into two, into two parts. And the M operator, the, the projection operator will, for example, be something like this. So what it does is that to, uh, you are averaging over, you're basically averaging the coordinate of your first of, of, of node one, two, three, and keeping the fourth node that it is in a separate cluster. And by definition of our lift operator, you the lift operator will look like this. And it's, and it's, and note that the lift operator is just a pseudo inverse of your of our cross grain operator with this you know and if you you know con contract them multiply them and contract together you get an identity matrix and if you you and if you multiply them together in another in another way you get you simply get a, a rank two matrix so this is a very simple uh, cross grain example and do I have questions in the comments? No, it's just, um, oh, ah, now we have, is it safe to think the lift operator, is it safe to think of the lift operator as one hot encoded cluster assignment? Yeah, essentially. So it's the operator that maps your cost essentially, yeah. So it, basically, so it's 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 a it's an operator that maps your coarse grain uh, node back to fine grain node. Yeah, essentially, that that's a that's idea of. Uh, okay. Yeah, but we can already see that the back map operator is not um, unique, or like there is not one back map operator that. Yeah. Would exactly. Yeah. So this is just, it's, so we, we choose a pseudo inverse. I think you, uh, and this definition of the lift operator will be useful later, um, but this is this is the one, um, so this is a construction that, uh, that bridged the uh, dimensionality gap uh, between the coarse grain space and the fine grain space. Uh, All right, then let's move on. So I'll move on. Um, right. So after seeing an example, hopefully um, uh, this is clear to everyone. Um, okay. I think another another key takeaway of 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 this coarse grain operation is that a coarse graining uh, in our in our case or or we call it a particle-based coarse graining, uh, as 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 I described in the last slide. Yeah, so we call it a particle-based coarse graining because we want to preserve the definition of particles after coarse graining. So this, for this for for this particle-based coarse graining, and we can show that this operator is actually uh, E3 equivalent. So the E3 equivalence come. Uh, uh, includes the rotation plus reflection and also translation equivalence. Uh, it's actually very easier to show because as I show, as I have shown, the transformation is fully, uh, is completely linear. So that is very easy to show that the coarse grain operation uh, respects the rotation and reflection uh, very, very nicely. So th there's no surprise there. Uh, uh, you naturally have the, at least have the rotation reflection. However, there's, uh, it's important to note that we we require that the the projecting weight are summed to one uh, within each cl cluster. So this is actually very important. Uh, if you go into the derivations, that is that very important to ensure the translation equivalence. Another way to understand it is that this normalization constraint uh, ensures that you have a consistent definition of momenta. Um, so that's that's another. So this full, this coarse grain definition we have is is critical uh, to con construct uh, to construct a particle based system that has consistent definition of 
uh, some physical quantities uh, with the right with the relevant symmetry. And another con another constraint that's important is that each atom uh, contribute to at most to one CG cluster. It's actually possible to construct a mapping that for for atom to con to contribute to uh, to not contribute to any CG clusters. Um, uh, but 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 uh, so that's that's possible. But you cannot contribute to more than uh, one uh, CG clusters. So the reason the reason uh, the reason is that you will lose the consistent definition of your moment uh, of uh, particle momenta. Um, so you want to look into more th theory behind this. You can look at this paper by a Professor Noid on this topic. Um, yeah, I think I think to recap. So the basic. So this is very similar to graph coarsening, just that uh, the the you the core the coarsening operator you define need to uh, uh, need to preserve the particle uh, the particle nature of your original geometrical graph. So other uh, other than that, the other other notations are very similar. Um, Okay, so so given that we know that M the the projection operation is E three equivariance, um, so we can derive some geometrical requirements of of the back mapping operation. So another 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 requirement I, I didn't I didn't talk about uh, is that the back mapping function needs to generate coordinates that can be consistently mapped mapped back to the course coordinates. So this might be a list, this sentence might be a little confusing, but this idea is that imagine you have a decoder function that uh, maps course geometries to uh, fine grain geometries. Um, you, you want the geometries that you obtained be mapped back consistently to the input uh, course grain geometries. And mathematically, uh, what you have is that, uh, so to, to reproject the the back map coordinate uh, with the co with, with your coarse graining operator, you need to obtain the original coarse grain representation or coarse grain geometry. Does um, this so go from coarse to fine and then back to coarse? We want yeah, it's just just that. So you have to you have to have a decoder that go from coarse to fine and go back consistently. Yeah, yeah. So the reason why you need to have that is that. As, as I mentioned, when you're back mapping, you want to make sure that ba your back map geometries is consistent or compatible with your coarse grain geometry. Uh, so this should be, so this is a hard coded requirement you need to respect. Um, if this is if if you uh, fail to satisfy this, you cannot say that okay, it's your your back map fine grain geometries represent the same thing that you want to uh, represent. So this is. Um, um. I have a question. Why here? Why do we need a function? Um, for example, given a fine-grained um, structure, we can in fact get the get the coarse grain. Why why do we need a function like uh, some parameters here? Oh, you mean the decoder function? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's. Uh, uh, the reason, so this decoder function is something we want to uh, learn, essentially, and we want to. Uh, so here we want to we want to know uh, what kind of properties this function need to respect given the constraint that we uh, we set. Does that answer your question? Um, so, so M it does not have parameters. So as okay. long as you have a cost grading map, uh, you can define a projection. Uh, with no ambiguity, but the back mapping function can be um, can have many choices. Can be linear, can be nonlinear. Um, it can has parameters. Uh, it can simply be a linear projection. And the backward the backward mapping takes the fine grained uh, coordinates as input and output the coarse grained. Uh, structure, is that right? Oh no! So the decoder function takes the coarse graining structure. Oh okay, I see. 
uh, and get the fine grain structure. Sorry, yeah. So the the big so the big X in our case is coarse grain. So that might be counterintuitive. Yeah. So the big X is a coarse grain, and the decoder function will give you a fine grain uh, with a fi the fine grain representation. And you want to make sure that your projection um, of, of obtained fine grain representation can be projected back to the original coarse grain representation, which is basically which is basically this identity. Well, in the linear case, which basically says that okay, so you want you want your yeah, I think it's I think it's clear. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the confusion. So the big X is a coarse grain coordinate and the small X is the fine grain coordinate. Yeah, it might be a little counterintuitive. Okay, so. so now we also say that it's like the decoder should be equivalent, right? If we rotate our input, then our output should also be rotated. Like the- Yeah, exactly. So exactly, yeah. very nice catch. So, when you have, because yeah, it's to to basically uh, restate what you said. So because um, we know that M is the E three equivalent, um, and also you need to satisfy satisfy the self consistency conditions. Um, it's all it's actually naturally required that your decoder to also be E three equivalent. Otherwise, you'll reach a contradiction. So you can actually easily show this with um, a proof with contradiction. Um, but so uh, I think to say it again, so because M is E3 equivalent and we require that the decoder, uh, the, back map, the back mapping decoder uh, be self-consistent uh, it also natural so this equivalence uh, the, this equivalence requirement nat naturally uh, trans also transfers to the decoder design so that the decoder also need to be e three equivalence. So there's a question. So when you apply the lift operator on the coarse grain representation, you create the copies of the coarse grained node representation to a larger representation. You are right. How do you make the higher dimensional representation distinguished? Um, oh, I think I understand your question. So, uh, so this is a question from Tuan. So, so basically, your lift operator essentially just copy coarse grain coordinate into back to fine grain coordinate. Um, so this is just some uh, um, mathematical construction that will be useful later for. Um, uh, uh, in our, in our formalism, um, yes, to distinguish that you will need to parameterize some additional function to di to distinguish all all this fine grain node. So it's not as simple as oh, you just apply the lift operator uh, to and you'll get everything back. It's not as easy as that. So that's but that's the simplest uh, uh, the simplest assumption, all, all the uh, the simplest approximation you can make about back mapping. Um, does that answer your question? I think I understand. I think I understand your question. So, hey, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, that was it basically. Uh, because usually, when you have the, when you do the coarse graining with the mapping, you you create you would kind of lift the space and then it's some kind of like inverse pooling operation and then it would. But if you were just to apply the this um, M matrix, you would just use or create copies of the coarse grain representations yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, into the um, larger space. So yeah, the yeah, yeah. I, you basically you need something more than just the lift operator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which I will talk yeah. about later. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so I think that there's another consideration I've been talking about. So um, coarse graining destroys information. So. What do you do, what do I mean by that? So, because cost screening perform a pool, it essentially performs the pooling operation of nodes. So you could have 
many fine grain uh, uh, fine grain representation of your coordinates be mapped back to, to to be mapped to the same coarse grain representation. So essentially, a, a coarse grain representation you have uh, could represent uh, many possible underlying fine grain distribution fine grained uh, uh, coordinates. So that's what I mean by uh, destroys information. So to reverse, to invert the, so, or another way to say it is that the cross screen operation is not invertible. Um, to get, to try to get something, to get, to get the missing information back, you need something more. Yeah, right? so now you just have a, a, some model that takes a cross grain, just takes, is just conditioned on a coarse grained representation and then gives you a probability or yeah, gives you a probability for a fine grained um, conformation. And then we can just sample from that and obtain different possible, there yeah, different possibilities for the fine grained re representation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you, you just right. said what I want to say. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. another way to, thank you. Another way to uh, describe uh, what Hannes just said is that you can cast the problem into a conditional generation task um, uh, with the with probabilistic graphical model uh, uh, showing here. So this basic idea. Yeah, Luigi, I think we're all familiar with the, like the basics of variational autoencoders and, and so on, the basics of machine learning. So I think we can actually skip this. Okay, okay. So the basic idea is that this is very similar. So this is just essentially uh, variational encoders yeah. with additional conditioning. Um, so this is uh, fairly established uh, stuff. Yeah, good, yes. So. I think I think it's still worth uh, going over some of the notations because that will be useful later. So yeah, I I disagree because this is the notation that's used everywhere, and we're all familiar with it. Okay. I, I think so. Let's just uh, yeah move okay. on. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I think all you all, all you need to know now is that we have a decoder, we have a prior, and we have an encoder, um, and there are loss functions associated with that. Um, so basically, we we use graph neural network to estimate all this uh, all, all all these three uh, distributions basically. Um, so some maybe some a bit uh, some more notations. So so the, the construction of the fine grain sorry the constructions of of of, of the encoder prior and the decoder model involves a graph representation. So that's just uh, be. Uh, be clear about some of the representation choice we, we made. So for the fine grain graph that we call G fine grain, so it describes the coordinates that lives in R small n times three. So how, and how we, de how we determine the edges. So basically uh, we determine the edges based on a radius cutoff. Uh, it's a very standard choice for geometric, geometric deep learning. And also there's associated you know, cost grain graph you can define. So this graph has fewer nodes. And for the edges, um, for the edges, we, we, uh, we, we decide uh, if two cost grain nodes have the edges, uh, if, if one of, at least one of the underlying fine grain nodes are connected. So this is one of, so one uh, choice is about the edges. Uh, you could also use a weighted adjacency matrix, uh, but that, that, that's, I think that's just a design choice. Um, okay, so that's uh, the graph representation we use. So, um, so for the encoder, so the, for the encoder, so the, what encoder does is that it takes the fine grain graph of fine grain geometries um, and convolves with the coarse grain geometries um, to, essentially uh, uh, parameterize the latent representation for the missing information. So that's the goal of this, um, uh, of, of this encoding architecture. So we use very standard message passing. Yeah, uh, and the pooling, the pooling we just do based on some traditional uh, coarse graining method, right? Like we just yeah. take the cluster assignments of some traditional Cost graining method, and that's what we use during training. Okay, good. 
Cool. And then uh, maybe about the, yeah, you have some message passing going on in there. And then you also have some message passing going on in the coarse grain representation. And yeah, how's the, how's the, the, our prior constructed? Like what, how is the thing constructed that we sample later on, that we sample from later on? Yeah, so, so this is the prior model. Yes, I think you are, um, yes, you are, so you are talking about the prior model, right? So yeah. the prior model will, will, will solely operate on the course and graph, basically, um, to, const to construct, uh, to, to parameterize, to parameterize the Z that's solely deconditioned on the big X. Uh, and I think one thing I forgot to mention is that, so well, so this encoder mixes information, excuse me, mixes information at the coarse and fine grain level. And how it mixes information is, is actually uh, uh, takes the edge feature uh, of the, the distance between the, the fine grain node and coarse grain node during the convolution. So there's, so, so there's, there are three steps. So the one step, you know, you perform cost, you perform graph convolutions on fine grain graphs and you have graph convolutions, you know, as the last step on the coarse grain graph. And there's a step in between that mixing information between the coarse, uh, that capture the geometric relationship between the coarse, the coarse geometry and the fine grain geometries based on this cluster assignment that we defined before. Um, and I think to answer uh, Hannah's question again, so there's a prior model that we need to uh, construct that to, uh, to infer, basically infer the, the latent information uh, solely from the core structure. Um, and we minimize uh, this KL divergence to make sure that the prior model uh, is, statistic is, is statistically similar to the, to the distribution that you obtain from the encoder model, basically. Does, do you have more questions on this? Does that answer your question? So yeah, this, absolutely. Uh, we need a prior. I just mean we, we, we don't want to go into that much details. I think most of the most of the things we are pretty intuitive and okay, okay. Are clear to most of the people and um, we've read the paper right so maybe you don't need to um, go into that much detail and we can just maybe come to for example the general thing of how you do the decoding and the tricky parts yeah okay okay sounds good yeah okay okay i will skip this part um, so then we'll, we'll talk about decoders, which is actually uh, actually pretty confusing part of the paper, I agree. Um, so, so the basic idea of decoder is that um, you want to construct uh, equivalent predictions for your fine grain geometries. And how you do that is to compile, you know, uh, coordinate predictions that constructed from, let's say, interatomic vectors uh, of, of, of your coarse-grained coordinate. And so that's, that's actually the basic idea. So there are some particular design choice may, we make for the, uh, for the decoder. Um, so this, I, I think, I, I know this slide might, could be a little confusing, but I think, but the basic idea is that for our decoder, there are some design choice in, uh, that, that is required um, to capture certain properties just of the decoder. Make the, you just do your message passing in such a way that the, the requirements on the left are fulfilled, right? Such that, um, for example, the pseudo vector, yeah, it transforms as we needed to transform under reflection yes. of the entire system. All right. And that's just achieved by designing the message passing layers as you have it on the right. And that's something we, for example, know from the pain paper. Yes, essentially. Right. So, 
So this architecture is very similar to the to the pain paper. Yes, uh, to the pain paper. Yes, um, just the, I, I think the essential difference is that there's um, we, we incorporate some pseudo features. Um, I think the reason why I want to incorporate pseudo features is following. So we want to the goal of this work is that of our model is that. Uh, we want our model to work even when the representation is extremely coarse. So imagine you have a large protein and we want to coarse grain into three beads. Um, and you, as you can imagine, the three beads actually will, will only span in a plane so that it's, it, so spanning a plane because all the, all the inter node vectors only lives in a plane as, as shown in this in this picture. So imagine because we use the internal vectors that to construct predictions for the fine grain geometries, the linear combinations of these uh, internal vectors will still live in a plane. So that, so that's obviously not enough, right? Because the geometries, the original ge geometries live in the full 3D space. Um, and the, the internal uh, the internal vectors are obviously not sufficient, and to um, to compensate for that, uh, we act we introduce additional cross products. So what cross product that does is that yeah, then we are orthogonal to the space, like and can go out of outside of the plane, and then yeah, if we aggregate one of the cross producted vectors. Then we, yeah, we're going outside of the space. That's a smart. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so this design choice is very is very specific for very coarse representation. So, but I think another issue if we incorporate cross product is that that will introduce pseudo vectors, um, which you need to, which you need to treat. Uh, very carefully because pseudo uh, pseudo vectors can break the reflection equivariance. Um, so that that so that would mean that so that so because of that it requires us to update um, those pseudo vectors, pseudo scalars, and vectors and scalars separately uh, that respect the geometrical rules. So that that's why there so uh, the decoder operation is uh, is a bit more involved. Um, here, so um, yeah, so that's the basic idea of the decoder. So the design choice we made about cross products is just because we want to uh, make our model expressive, expressive enough even for very low, uh, very low, low dimensional representation of your coarse graph. Um, I think this is this is I, I think this is an illustration of the previous figure that in experiment. So, if you don't have cross product, as I mentioned, all the internal vectors lives in a plane, and the linear combination of those those vectors still lives in a plane, so that you have very flat generative geometries um, when you only have three node representation of this molecule. However, when you increase cross products, it expands your representation power into the full 3D space. And you can you, you, you will see that, oh, okay, the, the fine grain geometries you obtain uh, becomes more 3D-ish so that you, you, have, um, you, you have the molecule that looks like a molecule in 3D. So that's okay. Yeah, so with the cross products, we definitely have more yeah, represent, representational power, as you call it. But then it introduces this issue of uh, having pseudo pseudo vectors. And now Gabriele Corso in the chat asks, why do you want reflection equivariance for the coarse grain dynamics? Oh, good good point. You don't you don't have to. Uh, so that's a good question. So I don't necessarily need reflection equivariance. So because um, a lot, actually, um, a lot of coarse grain dynamics or molecular dynamics in general, like you, you don't care about reflection, right? So if you, you have a, um, you, you, on, you only, you only, 
is, is, is a lot of times just enough to have the rotational and translational equivalence. Um, um, however, uh, so let's see. So you, you don't need your, mo so you, you, you are right that we don't have to use reflection equi equivalence, but uh, when you have very low dimensional uh, course representation of your coordinates, that, that's for example, we have three cor uh, a coordinate of size of three bead. Um, another, the constraint we actually cares about uh, the chirality information, because when you have three bead representation of your coordinate, because it lives in a plane, it becomes non-chiral. While the original coordinate can be could have some chirality information, so you want your model to have some capacity to process that information. So that's why we actually need to incorporate some pseudo features that we explicitly set to control the chirality. So that's that's uh, that's uh, that that's the idea. So we we don't. So in most of the cases, we could just uh, use the E3 equivariant network to do the decoder. Just it's getting tricky when you go into a very low, representation, uh, low dimensional representation where you, you sometimes might care about the chirality information where you don't have, and you need pseudo features to essentially break that symmetry. Do I have okay. more Yeah. Okay, so, so did I get correctly that you don't actually want many cases Reflection equivariant because you know it would you know not allow you to to have chirality and you handle this by adding non equivalent non reflection equivariant features and then keeping the rest kind of like if free yeah essentially yeah essentially and the uh, the pseudo features on the or the non equal non reflection equivalent features can be used to control the chirality when your course orientation loses the chirality. So that's another, yeah, that's that's the motivation for that. Um, I have to admit that the model design sacrificed a lot to handle the low dimensional, very, very low dimensional case. So a lot of times, uh, imagine you have a hundred, uh, a system of a hundred atoms, a lot of core screening just, for example, core screening them into 20 core screen beads. So a lot of times for practice, that's enough. But uh, in our work, we really want to uh, try for the really low, uh, uh, really low, really really low representation, as low as possible. Basically, so when when you have very low uh, low dimensional representation, there there could be issues uh, like that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes. Um, okay. So this is just some basic idea about uh, some intuition about pseudo vectors. I think uh, uh, many people are familiar. Um, so basic idea of pseudo vector is that when you, after the reflection transformation, there's additional sign flip. Um, well, for real vectors, you don't have this sign flip. So that the sign flip can uh, break the reflection equivalence. So th that's, why, that's why in our uh, decoder design, we have to be very careful to respect the geometrical rules to, to, uh, to, con to take account this effect. Um, Okay, some general uh, comments. So this decoder is obviously E3 equivalent, at least the part, at, at least the vector transformation we, 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 uh, we perform is a strictly E3 equivalent. So that's, that's good. And, 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 uh, and then I talk about, you know, how coarse, and there's some general comment about how coarse we can go. So in our framework, for any molecules, no, mag no matter how big it is, it could be tens of hundreds of thousands of molecules. It's possible to cross grain. You, it's always possible to cross grain uh, your molecules into three bead and go back. But that could be. But how do you go back might be very very challenging. But but at least um, our a three node representation of any molecule could be possible to uh, to go back to the original fine grain representation. So so three is actually the, the limit. You cannot do two because if you have a if 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 you cross screen your molecule into two beads, the inter node vectors will will only live in a in a 
uh, in a line, in a straight line. So there's no, you don't, you really don't have the expressive power to back map everything uh, back to 3D. Um, and also cross graining sometimes can destroy chiral information. And sometimes you want that chiral information. Um, so for example, three node orientation does not have chirality because it's just a plane. Um, so th th you could do some trick to initialize the pseudo features to get the chirality back, or at least break the symmetries to make your molecule choose the chiral symmetry. Um, so uh, to, to say again, so a lot of uh, involvement of this cross product, cross product is a sacrifice we have to make to uh, make our model work for very, low, very, very coarse representation. So, uh, so for the big N is equal to three case. Um, so this is design choice. So there's some additional design uh, consideration we have. Um, so imagine after course, after performing all this uh, back mapping operations, you end up with a, with a, uh, with with a, with an array of size big N times F times three. Um, but eventually, you just want the array of small n times three. So basically, so there, there needs to be some feature selection operation that you need to reconstruct the fine grain geometries back from this big n you know, times f times three array. So there's some uh, selection rules we can make based on the coarse grain mapping uh, we have. Um, so again, so the decoder generated vector features that lives in you know, big, uh, big n times f times three. And based on the cluster map, we can select the, the appropriate channels that belongs to each coarse, uh, coarse grain node and use that vector channel uh, as, as, our, uh, as our vector uh, to predict the fine grain uh, coordinate displaced from the original coarse grain coordinate. Um, so there's some uh, some uh, channel selection rules. So the basically, uh, I think to go in a bit into more detail. So for each coarse grain feature, um, for example, for this gray node, uh, for example, it's responsible for four fine gray node. You want to go in there and pick the four the first four vector channels to be used as your fine grained uh, coordinate prediction, and for this blue node. Uh, it's responsible to for two fine grain nodes. You pick the first two uh, fine grain, sorry, you you pick the first two uh, vector channels uh, as your prediction for your fine grain geometries, and the same for the red node. So that's the basic idea of this operation. Um, for, as, for the coarse graining method that you use, do you usually have to? Like you're using one always in all of your experiments, right? Uh, do you usually have to specify the number of coarse grained atoms you want, or is yes, the... yes, you you would need to specify that, yeah. Okay. Yes, so you need to specify, you know, given a mapping, a coarse grain mapping, you define your coarse grain operation, so that will set your the number of coarse grain atoms you have, but it's up to you uh, how you want to construct the mapping, so. You can, it's possible to make, you know, for example, uh, one cost grain be to be responsible for arbitrary number of fine grain bead. So you, you can make that choice. Uh, yeah, but I mean, your F has to be large enough here to- Yeah, so F need, yeah, exactly. So F need to be larger than the largest cluster size, yes. Yeah, F need to be large enough, you're yeah, right. And that, that also means we sometimes we can't really generalize, right? We, to, to larger systems than we trained on. You can actually generalize. So, okay, this is actually a really good question. So you can generalize if you define your cost screen mapping consistently across. Okay, so then, then if, we, if you have a larger system, then you need to cost grain differently, like, to, you need to scale up the, the number of coarse grained atoms that you use. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm following. So well, you need to, if you have a, um, 
if you train with systems or with molecules that always have size 20 and you always coarse grain them to five atoms or five coarse grain, uh, five beads is what you call it, right? And then you scale up to a hundred, like you want to generalize to a system with a hundred atoms, then you need to use your coarse graining method with um, 25 beads. Oh, I see. I, I see your question. So I, I think you are right. So um, I, I yeah, I think I, I think you are right. So, okay, but Don but also has a has a point on this. I think. Um, Don, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, so basically, I think for Hannes' point, the number of atom per beads must be uh, somewhat constant, like the maximum yes, it, number exactly, of atom yeah. per beads yeah, must yeah. be constant. Exactly. Yeah. So, so for each type of bead, you need to have constant number of fine grain bead. That's it's responsible for. Yeah. Yeah. So, so as you said, so it does not generalize. For example, if you all of a sudden want your bead to represent, so if you train on, if you're training your model in a way that each bead is re responsible for five cross grain bead, you cannot generalize to a case where each cross grain bead is all of a sudden re responsible for 20 beads. It, it does, yeah. it's not possible yet. Yeah, okay. So here a comment that I have uh, regarding this kind of uh, generations. Um, right now, the way you do it is that uh, you have a constant number of channels. You generate a few embeddings and you select uh, depending on the number of atoms that it has. Uh, but a, a problem that I have is, uh, for example, like if you take this first line here and this second line here, uh, since they're treated as uh, channels uh, in the like in the matrix that you generate, is there a way that uh, the first node knows what the second node is like uh, in that bead? Because like when you do, for example, sequence generation, you generate one element after the other and each element knows what the previous elements uh, that were generated were. Uh, but here, like it seems that you're generating, um, you're, you're generating all of them in parallel, like uh, yeah. without having them know what the other is doing because you're treating them as separate uh, channels for, for the network. So um, yeah, so how do you ensure that like every node knows like a bit, well, when, uh, when every node is getting generated, it knows what the other nodes are within that, within that same bead. Yeah, that's a good question. So it, it's, yes, it's indeed generating parallel. So they are in some sense independent, but this vector channels are generated, are generated, um, let's see. So those vector channels are, genera are generated via convolution. So there's some, so to, to, to obtain your final vector predictions, there's, you have to go through iterations of convolutions. So in that sense, there's some channel mixing operation involved, uh, but that's the final stage. You are right that you only pick one. So it's not done in a recurrent way. Uh, but they're not independent, right? We mix them all the time. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the channels are not independent for sure. Just as uh, in your last step, you just retrieve them uh, straight up to, to obtain yeah. the point. So the, I, the channels the channels are used at every step. Yes so, yes. so at every step of the decoding, you have this constant number of channels that yeah. have convolution done on them. Yes. And then you only select uh, a few. So so in some sense, they are aware of like everything else at all time. Yeah, yeah, in, in some sense, yes. Yeah. But I, I think I understand your your question though, like you want your, you want this generation to sort of be aware of its neighbors in some organic way, right? So yeah. Um, and when you do the convolution, like uh, for example, for, 
for the beats that have only two nodes, well, you do the convolution like with the uh, all n entries, um, even though it has only two nodes. Um, so is there, I don't know, some sort of, uh, is there some sort of, uh, uh, I, I don't know what to say, but like, um, for example, when you do attention, like you have this uh, mask that uh, does not uh, does not participate to the attention. Like, do you have some sort of mask also here that mean they don't participate in the convolution or they still participate? No, I don't have any mask, but I, I so this is just straight up channel selection. So at once indexing in PyTorch, basically. Uh, but what you suggested could be some, some interesting design alternative for this. Uh, yeah, just. Yeah, but, but you do the indexing at the, at the end, right? At the end, but yeah. before that, you do lots of convolution with yes. nodes that uh, don't necessarily um, exist. OK, so you think so. The, the, some of the convolutions are wasteful because they don't, the, we, we have uh we have well, more dimensions than we actually need right is that your well wasteful in terms of resources uh yes but the main uh -huh. concern is that uh they they can generate noise in the rest of the embeddings in some sense because like they okay. they don't correspond to to anything so uh like why why don't the beads like because you, you do the coarsening you know uh what's the in initial coarsening that you do so why don't the beads uh, know in advance, like instead of doing indexing, they, they know in advance how many atoms are within that coarsening and you try to, uh, to, to recreate that, right? Yeah, I think that's possible. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think you, we, could, uh, we could make convolution design so that it's, uh, so that each coarse grain bead is aware of, uh, what are the actual number of channels it need to produce? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that could be an interesting design exploration, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just a set creation problem, right? Or the yeah. set generation problem. And there are different ways of generating sets. And maybe I'll refer to the presentation of Clément Vignac in the reading group two weeks or three weeks ago where you he proposes or yeah you can see different ways to generate sets okay i will thank you i will look into that but yeah i i think i get the i get i get the comment yeah uh, okay yeah thank you for for the thank answer you, thank you yeah thank you for the uh, suggestion yeah um okay uh i think to to sum up this part, so you know, as a final bit, uh, final uh, bit of the of, of the decoder, so um, there's this some recentering operation we need to perform, so to ensure that there, uh, the self consistent self consistency requirements is satisfied. Um, so what it essentially does is uh, does is that it's uh, after you generate the relative coordinates, the delta x that you obtain from those channels. Um, so you want to uh, project them to make sure that there's no shifting uh, 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 in the coordinate reference. So what it does is that you project all the, re uh, uh, the relative coordinate you generated uh, and lift them back into the fine grain space and you subtract those differences. So you, you make sure that um, the vectors you generate has no geometrical shifting so that you, after the decoding you have, you obtained what can be consistently mapped back to the original input coarse grain structure of big X. Um, so this is just uh, some, uh, some, some uh, straightforward bit to ensure the self-consistency requirement. Um, okay, so just for the training, I think everyone's familiar just just want to point out that the loss function for the reconstruction include the mean square deviation loss, which is a straightforward uh, loss. And also we incorporate some graphical loss to make sure that the, the model is supervised to, perverse, uh, to uh, preserve the, the chemical bond structure. 
uh, and as for sampling, as you know, as you know, everyone uh, probably is very familiar with that. You uh, after training, um, you sample from your prior uh, given a core screen structure to generate the uh, the feature vector for Z, and you use your Z and big X to generate your final fine grain geometries. And during the sampling uh, procedures, all your information you need is big X, basically the course representation. Um, just quickly talk about the experiments. So we use LNI dipeptide trajectory, we use two data sets. So we have the LNI dipeptide trajectories, which is a very classical benchmark molecule for chemical physicists um, to, to benchmark the enhanced sampling, uh, enhanced sampling method. So it has, you know, 20, it's a, it's a relatively small molecule. It has 22 atoms. Um, and it has features this uh, two uh, central dihedral angles uh, that which uh, which one can use to produce a, something called Ramachandra plot, uh, which which characterizes the different conformational state of this molecule. And another bigger molecule uses a chig chignoling. It's a, it's a very small fast folding mini protein that we obtained. Uh, so it's it's slightly bigger and it's, uh, the structure is more complicated. And for the metrics, we, we look at three metrics. We look at the reconstruction, a root mean square deviation. Uh, just this is to measure that if our autoencoding procedure can, how well it can reconstruct, uh, can preserve the, you know, the structure uh, to, to reconstruct, to encode the cause grain structure. Yeah, and, and why is the sampling RMSD like if we compare the RMSG of the generated structures and the reference structures, why is it better if it's higher? Oh, so it simply means that you the model can uh, can generate geometries that uh, that looks different from your reference. So it's a, like a diversity measure. Yeah, some it's, it's some measure of diversity basically. Okay. Um. So for the and reconstruction, then, yeah. In the as the last measure, you also look at how many of the bonds are correctly, yeah, how many of the bonds are as in the original graph if we take some radius cutoffs to create the bonds. Yes, right. essentially, yeah. So there and are some the cost grain cost grain mapping generations, like your third point. Uh-huh. So yeah, so we use uh so so cost green autoencoders that we use in one of our early works. So that's basically train a deterministic autoencoder to learn the cost green mapping. So the, the basic idea is it learns to cost, uh, cost green um, the, the collective motions together to, uh, to, maximize, to maxim, maximally reproduce the fine green geometries. So this is just a mapping choice. Uh, I actually tried random mapping, it also works. Uh, so um, I haven't studied carefully about the, the effect of mapping, but as long as you group, uh, you know, fine grain, fine grain nodes that are close together into one single cluster, the results is usually pretty good. So, um, but it's, 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 it's a research direction one can go into to, to carefully study the effect of mapping. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what I think is important, like how do your baselines work? Oh, so the, the baselines I choose is simple. So it's simply, so it's all based on previous works. So there's a, a simple MLP, uh, what, which what it does is it's a, it's a simple, but you know, I would say it works fairly well. So it just takes your flattened coordinate, the coarse grain coordinate, um, and use your MLP, use that as your input for MLP and uh, produce the fine grain coordinate and reshape to get the, uh, the, the fine grain coordinates. So that's, that's one baseline that people have proposed. Um, but the problem is that it's not, it does not have uh, E3 equivalence. So it means that it can be, uh, yeah, the, the linear the linear one is better, right? The the space line. I actually forget the. Uh, let me look at it. Um, so I think I think I think the MLP actually works slightly better. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the linear one is the problem is that it's a linear geometrical projection, but it's learned in a data driven way. Um, the expressiveness is pretty limited. But if you choose, if, if your representation is not too coarse, it actually works fairly well, actually. Um, um, yeah. Okay, but the one thing that's missing here is uh, what's the training data? Oh, the training data we use is uh, the two trajectory, molecular dynamics trajectory we described in here. Oh, wait. So we don't even try to. I thought, yeah, we train on many, many uh, molecules and then we try to generalize to. Yeah, then we try to generalize to other molecules. Oh, there are actually generalization experiments later. Yes, I do have results for that. But okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, um, so this task is specifically for, so for this uh, benchmark, we didn't um, show the transferability. Uh, the reason is that we want to show that our model is very flexible to any mapping choice but sometimes your mapping choice can hurt your transferability because there are certain mapping only works. Uh, you could have easily have mapping choice that's not transferable um, to other chemical systems, uh, but you could have uh, some consistent chemical, transferable, chemical transferable mapping choice. For okay. example, you could map all your proteins onto uh, alpha carbons, for example. So that will be a very chemically transferable and consistent mapping choice. Yeah. So this class is specifically for, you know, if you have molecular dynamic trajectory, you have a coarse grain, you coarse grain them how well it can go back. Yeah. But I, 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 have, I have one slide later about transferability. Yeah, yeah. Well, then let's get them to the results. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I'm towards the end. Uh, I think just this is a result. I think you can focus on the, uh, on the results. So. I think one thing that I find pretty, pretty remarkable is that um, for a molecule that has only 20, uh, for, uh, for, sorry, for, for, for example, for this alanine dipeptide um, uh, molecule, which has 23, 22 atoms with only three Bs, you can actually recover uh, the geometries fairly well with very high accuracy. And similarly for the chignoline example, it has 175 atoms um, you can cause grain into six Bs, and you can still have pretty pretty good results. Um, but obviously, the more bead or more the, the less coarse uh, a representation you have, the better the result you have. Uh, but I think just to me, it's pretty uh, just pretty remarkable to see how coarse you can go. Um, um, okay, to maybe answer uh, Hannah's question, so there are some. You could apply this to, you know, protein structures and to show some chemically transferable results. So, but I think the trick part is that you have to choose your mapping protocol consistently, meaning that uh, you need to have, for example, the the if you have uh, you know a coarse grain B that represents, you know, a clustering of certain type of atoms. So that coarse grain type need to exist in your other, in, uh, in, in some of your other structures. So one consistent, you know, one, one such example is to coarse grain your protein structure into alpha carbons, right? Because all proteins for each amino acid, you have alpha carbon, you can choose, you can go to. So that's, that's mapping protocol is transferable. So we could, uh, you know, shows us to you know compare that to sorry we, we can apply that to back mapping protein structure based on um, alpha carbons um, uh, alpha carbons and we compare with the baseline which is a compare a compare it's, it's a it's a it's a protein modeling package package on modeler so it has some geometry optimization routines to back map from alpha carbons to fine grain geometries. 
Um, so we compare our model. So we show that our, our model is better in terms of RMSD. Yeah, well, faster. On, the, yeah. on the X axis, you just have a bunch of different uh, molecules, uh, a bunch of different proteins, right? Yes. And yeah, okay. And we see that the RMSD is lower all yeah. the time, actually. And yes, you're yes. also always faster. Yes. Much faster. And we and we make sure that the back mapped fine grained geometries is self consistent, meaning that it always map back to the health carbon. And the problem of modeler is that during the optimization, the protein structure can be distorted and drifted, so that that actually increase uh, some of the error. Um, so this is some some just some backup result to show that it's transferable. The problem is that. Uh, we don't have chemically diverse molecular dynamics data for protein, uh, so that we, we, the experiment can only be done um, on static structures. So there's no version autoencoders. It's simply just autoencoding, backmapping. Uh, so that's so that brings to my some some uh, to, to the first point of some of my future considerations is that we need to show that it's chem chemically transferable for modeling. Um, we show that we can do the to backmap protein, but the problem is that we don't have chemically diverse MD data. Um, so that's a, that's a limitation. If, if such data set exists, I think it could be possible to perform such a task to, uh, to, to show that it actually generalizes in the molecular dynamic setting. Um, so we can also, a natural uh, next step is to extend this to condensed phase systems. So liquid water, uh, liquid pol uh, or polymer systems that's, uh, that's condensed phase that lives in a periodic box. Um, and uh, another, you know, a, a, another uh, direction that one could go into is that could we, could we study the effect of mapping? Uh, and could we find the optimal mapping that, that, uh, that can further improve the back mapping results? I think the answer is yes and possible. And I think another a theoretical uh, um, aspect that's been missing is that although we you know, derive some of the you know, geometrical requirement and the design of the decoder you need to respect equivalence, but you know, in terms of, and we use the conditional VAE to perform the generation, but could there be you know, some more rigorous inform information theoretical framework for back mapping? I think that concludes my uh, my presentation. Yeah, I'm happy to take more questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Then thank you very much for the presentation and yeah for for going through the whole paper. And yeah, are there any other questions? You can feel free to unmute. But there's nothing from my side. I'm well, well served. <laughs> yeah. Tom, do you have a few words? Uh, a quick question, like uh, when you do, um, so the idea here like is to use a non-machine learning model for the simulation, um, but only use machine learning to do the coarsening and the de-coarsening of uh, the model, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, so. to also use a machine, non-machine learning to do the coarsening, right? That would also work. Yeah, you could also do the coarsening with the non-machine learning way. Yes. So, um, so here, like the the idea is that uh, machine learning is only used to to decoarsen what has been yes. coarsened. Yes. Um, yeah. And. Uh, so the question like here is when you define different levels of coarsening, uh, like is this well defined how like uh, you can simulate this different level of coarsening or um, so, so for example, like if you decide instead of coarsening a protein by uh, like the main chain and the side chain, you decide for example, for some reason that you want to, to coarsen it, every amino acid becomes four beads um like instead of the standard one or two beads um so does that make it like is, are there techniques to do the simulation like that or like there are predefined 
uh, coarsening levels uh, that are known to like that have known equations for the simulation, for example. Yeah, great question. Yeah. So it's 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 actually very possible that you can define a a mapping that's too coarse that you cannot simulate. Um, because it loses so much information. So for example, for this uh, example, we have, you know, we course grain this, you know, a 200, uh, a 175 atom molecule into six beads is very likely that it's very, it's going to be very challenging to derive such effective uh, course grain interaction to simulate that. So, but we, the, the, the premises of this talk is that we want to disentangle from the problem of uh, learn to simulate course grain dynamics uh, from you know the the problem of you know how how far can you go in terms of back mapping so uh, so the short answer to your question is that it's very possible that you cannot simulate whatever cause green mapping you want however there's this martini force field let me go back to so that you also ask about you know can we build up you know um, is there a systematic way to have coarse grain simulation tools uh, that you ha basically have some non-interactions or non-equations you can use? So, so yes, there exists some. So there's this Martini force field, uh, which um, provide a, a systematic mapping choice um, that you can use and also some uh, elementary uh, building blocks for your coarse grain molecular design so that you can basically use this as uh, some Lego to build your molecules. And also it will provide the associated um, uh, cost graining, to pro also provide the associated, uh, uh, the cost grain potential that you can use. Uh, However, it's okay. not, it's, uh, it's, it's under debate if it's accurate enough, at least uh, for simulating protein folding, I, I don't think this is uh, accurate enough. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. No, this sounds interesting. Uh, but one point that I'd like to mention here is that with your method, the way that you encode and then decode, the, the fact that you're able to decode almost perfectly means that when you encode the representation, you create a coarsened representation that has most, if not all, the information of the individual elements of that representation. So uh, one one of the thing I was thinking is that even then, like one could improve the course and simulation by leveraging the embeddings from the encoder itself. Uh, I, I believe like this, uh, I, I don't know how this would be possible to be done uh, and if it's possible to be done in an entirely non-machine learning way, uh, but uh, it would be super interesting to take like this course and representation and via an MLP, um, give some parameters for the force field to make the force field more accurate at the coarsen level as well, uh, right? So uh, because your coarsen representation, by being able to being decoded perfectly or almost perfectly, has all the information it needs uh, from the geometry. So um, it would be super interesting to see, like, can we help improve course and simulation also, and not just can we course and de course. In? Yeah, that yeah. sounds like a great idea to me. Uh, I think that's definitely a great idea. I, I do have one comment on that is that um, it's actually, it's actually a not well-defined questions. Uh, it's not a well-defined question to ask uh, if your cause grain method is accurate or not because there are, there are all sorts of different kind of subtleties. So to, from, from, the, from the theoretical foundation of st statistical mechanics, um, because cost screening loses information, it's, it's making the problem of, you know, how accurate your cost screen information, uh, cost screen simulation, not a well-defined question anymore, actually. So, that's why it's actually a bit ambiguous to define, you know, um, learning the cost grain dynamics as a machine learning problem in some sense. Uh, so this actually, 
uh, in some sense a bit tricky, I would say, because there are there are different uh, different philosophies and also different methodologies in uh, of cost screening that focus on different aspect of accuracy. Um, and we haven't had a model that that you know capture all the all the information you want to preserve in cost screen model. So for example, some cost screen method focusing on recover the so-called potential of mean force. But we all know that if we even if we get a very accurate potential of mean force, we lose all the other dynamic information and also thermodynamic uh, observables uh, that uh, that we can no longer recover very accurately. Um, so that so there's issue of that. And some people focus on uh, performing uh, optimizations to learn cost grain, cost grain force field that recover experimental properties really well. However, it comes uh, 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 to achieve that you, lo you actually lose all the st statistical mechanical rigorous that has been established in, uh, you know, uh, from equilibrium thermodynamics. So there's so 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 so, so I think my to to summarize my comment is that it's because there are so many aspects of cost screening accuracy and, and so many aspects of cost screening and there are so many aspects you want to preserve and it's impossible to preserve all of the you know descriptions you have to make sacrifices and some. And some of the aspects um, cannot. It's 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 actually pretty uh, tricky uh, to. Yeah, yeah, but we don't problem. really have to make sacrifices, right? If we, for example, have a machine learned molecular dynamics simulation method that uses the features that you create during your encoding, like during your uh, coarsening. Mm -hmm. because those features can carry that additional information also and then what Dom is suggesting these features can maybe also be improved to learn the parameters of a classical um, molecular dynamics simulation and yeah of course then you can't have all of the information still because you're cramming it into a few parameters but maybe we can improve the parameters of the simulation a little bit yeah i think yeah for sure that's, that's definitely true. i agree so there's definitely space for improvement i think just i want to say is that honestly i feel like the to cast the cost graining dynamics as a machine learning problem it's a bit eo defined now uh, just due to the subtlety of the of the problem setup yeah yeah probably but you if you if or, you but i agree yeah. that if you if you you know establish your learning objective for sure yeah you you could yeah you know. good yeah all right uh, thanks uh, for the great presentation really enjoyed the the paper and like the idea of uh, decoarsening molecules i think it's uh, something that uh, um, that will really come in handy, especially, for example, with methods like alpha fold, one can imagine getting more accurate uh, protein representation of every atom. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a great presentation. Thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. That was a great discussion. I especially found the point of Tom in the end interesting that maybe we can even improve coarse grain molecular dynamics simulations. And by because we have these features, uh, we, if we have a learned encoding of the coarse grain representations, and yeah, then we can just include them in some machine learning molecular dynamics. All right, but we'll have many more interesting discussions like this. So feel free to follow us on social media where we update you about this sort of thing or find the Slack channel and the email mailing list in the description to stay updated about all the upcoming papers.